welcome to Product Austin. My name is Prabhakar Gopalan, and uh, that's Josh Duncan and Roger Coven. The two of us together organize uh, Product Austin meetups. Uh, there's several others who have helped us, like Ashley at the uh, Camel Factory, who's the meetup coordinator. Brandon. And Brandon at the ticketing desk. So uh, for those of you uh, who had a little bit of confusion with the Meetup versus Eventbrite, we just want to say it's easier for us to manage through Eventbrite, even though Meetup is a good community uh, website. So in, in the future, um, please check out the Eventbrite site. Make sure you register there so it's easy for us later to uh, communicate with you and things like that. Um, so for those of you, how many are new to Product Austin? Fantastic. So, um, you know, we are a group focused on building the whole product with, um, when we think about product in a very holistic way and our goal is to bring a lot of exciting speakers from all over the country and, you know, we've also reached out to people outside the country. So you're probably going to see in a, in a few months people from outside the country from Europe also come here and give uh, talks. Um, today we're very, very happy and uh, delighted to have near you all. Um, and, uh, our membership was zero in August last year, and right now it's like 642. So we have the Paul Graham 2% uh, week or, or week or <laughs> growth. We're a little startup ourselves. Um, so um, with that, I want to give the uh, mic to Josh Duncan. He asked him to introduce the speaker first. All right, let's see how this works here. Um, again, thanks to you all for. Um, Oh yes, yes, uh, thank you all for coming. If you have questions, comments, feedback, uh, hashtag Product Austin or at Product Austin, uh, that'll appear on the big board up there, so anything good to share, please do. Um, I just wanted to introduce our host real quick and, and uh, give him a little intro. Um, hopefully you all have, have seen the book by now. It's a, it's a very interesting topic and a very relevant one for um, Product Austin. So just real quick, how many, uh, how many people here are involved with either you know, starting a company or at a startup or kind of trying to get something off the ground? All right, all right. that's a great number because that's definitely um, kind of a, a common theme and one of our topics for tonight. And so um, any of you that are involved in trying to get a product started or, or trying to build something, um, as you either have learned or will quickly learn, getting customers, getting users to use those products are kind of very, very important, one might say. One might say it's um, almost paramount to survival. If you can't get your customers to continue to use the product, to be part and engage with the product, um, it's essentially going to be the end of your business or the end of your product. So it's either, um, I think there's a great quote in the, the book, it's either habit or survive, habit's part of survival, habit or die. And I think that's one of the interesting things we're gonna talk about or hear about tonight is forming these habits Making your users engaged is not something that happens by accident. It isn't something you can kind of hope that they figure out down the road. There's an approach and there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And that's why I'm really excited to introduce uh, Nir Riel, who's going to talk to us about forming habit and building a habit related product. So, Nir? Um, you know, can you hear me in the back if I just, uh, you can hear me all right? Okay, so I'm just not going to use the mic. Um, hi, everybody. Good to see you. I, uh, I'm a big fan of Austin. I don't come here very often, but every time I do, I've, I've been here one other time and loved it, so I'm really glad to be back. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for uh, coming in. By the way, if you don't feel like standing, I'm totally cool with you sitting down here if you want so that you don't have to get tired there on your feet. Um, today, we're going to be talking about habits and habit-forming products. Before I start, quick show of hands, how many of you have seen my presentation before or read the book? Okay, not, not too many of you, fantastic. But uh, what I wanna do, you know, I, one of the things that I hate uh, going to see when you see an author that just wrote a book and, they, and then you go see them talk and they basically like read the book to you, uh, I don't wanna do that because you can read my book for yourself. You don't need me to recite it for you, you know how to read. But what I'd like to do is to kind of give a, a, an overview of the model. I'll give you kind of an overview of the work I've done uh, over the past three years or so on Happy Forming Products. But then I wanna leave plenty of time uh, about half the time I want to leave for Q&A so that I can hear from you what kind of challenges related to user engagement you're facing, what's keeping you up at night, so we can really dive in. Is that, does that sound okay? All right, terrific. So let's, let's get to work here. So if there's one thing we know about these gadgets that are in our pockets these days, about these little uh, technologies that we're all carrying around with us, is that the technologies we, we use, the products we use, have a profound impact on our day-to-day -day behaviors, on our day-to-day -day lives. And so what I've done over the past several years is to look at patterns, is to try and identify what it is 
about these products and about these specific companies that can so profoundly and quickly change users' behavior. One of the first patterns that emerged in my research was that I found that these products tend to follow this pattern of starting out as a toy. They start out as these products that are frequently dismissed. People just kind of slough them off and say, oh, okay, that's a feature of somebody else's product, no big deal. And yet within the span of a few short years, maybe five to 10 years, these products are touching the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of users. And they're making hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. So who am I talking about? What companies come to mind when I give that description? Who do you think of? Twitter. Twitter, yeah, huge IPO that, uh, this past year. Who else? Instagram, yeah, 12 people, 18 months, bought for a billion dollars by Facebook. And now that actually seems like nothing, right? Who, who did Facebook more recently buy? WhatsApp for $22 billion, this little silly messaging service, right? They picked up for $22 billion. Well, I'll give you 22 billion reasons why habits matter, because part of why that company is worth so much, why that company was acquired for that much money, is because 74% of people who have downloaded that app use it every single day. Talk about the tremendous economic value of a company that creates these habits. And there's other companies as well, right? There's Pinterest, and there's, um, there's uh, in the enterprise space, a company like Slack, fastest growing enterprise company in history, and there's others that we see these repeating patterns form time and time again. And so that's what I want to share with you today. Now, uh, I've been working on this book for the past three and a half years. It just launched in November. I made the Wall Street Journal list. We're very happy about that. I wrote it with Ryan Hoover. Anybody? Oh, thank you <laughs> for the one person in class. Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I wrote the book with Ryan Hoover. Anybody know who Ryan Hoover is? Anybody? Product, yeah. Hunt. product Hunt. Anybody use Product Hunt? All right. Very habit forming product. The next thing that, that Ryan did after we worked on this book together was, was start Product Hunt. So um, I do have to warn you, though, that I'm going to go through a lot of information because I want to get to the Q&A part and really hear from you all. Uh, we're going to go through the kind of the basis of the book pretty quick. It's a 250-page book. I teach the content of the book pretty much in a class at Stanford, at the design school and the graduate school of business at Stanford. It's a three-week course. So we're going to condense a lot into a little bit of time, but this is a very smart crowd, so you, you'll keep, keep up. But if you have any questions, just you know, wave your hand and we can stop and, and, and chat for a little bit. So. Before we really dive in, let's make sure we're all on the same page about what is a habit. A habit is defined as a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. These impulses that we feel throughout our day to do these behaviors with little or no conscious thought. And it turns out that about half of what we do every day, day in and day out, whether you like it or not, is done purely out of habit. These behaviors done with little or no conscious thought. Now, I believe that we're on the precipice of an age where we can use habits for good, and I'm not alone. Because today, there's an explosion of companies that are using the psychology of habit design to help people live happier, healthier, more connected, more productive lives, and that's what I want to help you do tonight. So here it is. Here's the pattern that we find endemic to all sorts of habit-forming products. These behaviors done with little or no conscious thought. It's called the hook. A hook is defined as an experience designed to connect your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. Connecting your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. And we find that through successive cycles, through these four steps, this is how customer preferences are shaped how tastes are formed, and how these habits take hold. So we're going to walk through these four basic steps tonight. So every hook starts with a trigger. A trigger tells the user what to do next. It prompts our next action. And these triggers come in two types, two flavors, if you will. We have our external triggers, and we also have internal triggers. External triggers you'll be very familiar with. These are things in our environment that tell the user what to do next with some kind of information in the trigger. 
click here, buy now, play this, a friend telling you about this great new app that you should really try out, all examples of external triggers. We in the product development community, we know all about these external triggers. You know, we as consumers know all about these external triggers. We see them every day. But what product people don't consider enough and what turns out to be absolutely critical to forming these long-term habits is establishing an association with an internal trigger. Internal triggers are things that tell the user what to do next. They prompt the next action, just as reliably as those external triggers, but the information for what to do is not in the external trigger, but instead informed through some memory, some association in the user's mind. So what we do in response to being in a certain place, a certain situation, a certain routine, around certain people, and most frequently when we experience particular emotions, dictates what we do next. Dictates these behaviors that we do with little or no conscious thought. Now the most frequent internal triggers are not just these emotions, but a specific type of emotion. I'm referring to negative emotions. So what we do when we're feeling lonely, or sad, or dissatisfied, or fatigued, or powerless, or lost, or confused, what we do when we experience these negative emotions dictates the solutions we look for. There's one thing the brain is really good at, is pattern matching. So whatever can provide relief to these pain points, that's what we turn to time and again with little or no conscious thought. Now some of the research that shows this is the case comes to us from a study that found that people suffering from depression check email more. Mm. Now think about that for a minute. Why would that be? <laughs> Why would people suffering from clinical depression check email more? Well, it turns out what this study found was that people suffering from depression experience what psychologists call negative valence states. They feel down more frequently than the rest of the population. And what are they doing to boost their mood to get out of that negative valence state? They're checking their devices. They're going on email more frequently than the rest of the population. And of course, we all do this to some degree, don't we? What website or what app do people check when they're feeling lonely? Where do, where do people go? It's Facebook. Facebook, of course. Where do people go? Where do we go when we're feeling uncertain? Before we scan our brains to see if we know the answer, what do we do? Google. We Google it, right? And what about when we're feeling bored? You know, between two and four o'clock in the afternoon, you have that big project you don't feel like working on, where do you go? Where do you go? <laughs> you go to Reddit, you go to YouTube, you go to check sports scores and stock prices and fashion magazine, right? There's all these solutions for this internal trigger of boredom. We don't like this sensation of boredom. It's a negative valence state, it feels bad. And to get out of that negative balance state, we turn to these solutions, to these products, with little or no conscious thought. So what do we do with this? It's a bit of uh, oops, I'm sorry. You guys were behind this. OK, sorry. So what do we do with this? I told you that this was about creating products that help people, that enhance their lives, that, that help people live richer lives. So how do we build products to improve people's lives, knowing about the importance of attaching to these internal triggers? Well, it fundamentally comes down to understanding what is your user's itch. That far too many of us in the product development community, we're really good at building for the functional requirements of our products, but we fail to consider the psychological requirements of what our products do for our users. So we have to understand that itch. We have to understand the psychological need that we're fulfilling if we want to create an association with these internal triggers. Let's do a case study here. How many of you use Instagram regularly? Okay, got a lot of people, terrific. Let's do a quick case study on what it made Instagram such a habit-forming product. Did you say you use Instagram a lot? Okay, terrific, you're gonna be my, my uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna pick on you a little bit. So, let's first start with uh, the external triggers. How did most people first find out about Instagram? What channels? Through Twitter, Facebook, right? People posted their pictures on Twitter and Facebook and, uh, or through word of mouth. And when you went to these platforms and you saw someone's picture, you'd see a little call to action that said, check out my photo on Instagram. You click on that button, it would take you to 
the, the, the site, you've installed the app on your phone at some point, and now you have these external triggers of the app icon on your home screen, right? That's an external trigger. And now you also get notifications telling you every time your friends do something on the platform. Those are examples of external triggers as well. Let's talk about Instagram's internal triggers. So what's your name? Catherine. Catherine. Do you remember the last thing you took a picture of with Instagram? Um, if it's suitable for work? <laughs> <laughs> well, my last post was a TVT um, because my, ro my roommate from college is moving to Austin. Oh, okay. And yeah. you took a picture of her? Her and I. Oh, the two of you. In college. Oh, okay. So, posted that. And did your roommate say, take a picture of me with Instagram? No. No, she didn't say that, right? So when people take pictures of other folks or the sunset or what they're eating, very rarely does someone say, hey, take a picture of me with Instagram, particularly if it's just your plate of food, right? <laughs> but why do people have this association that instantly, when she wanted to capture this moment, when you wanted to hold on to this moment in time, the solution was Instagram. The solution for this fear of losing this moment forever was Instagram. Now what other company, when I talk about this fear of losing the moment in the photography space, many of us were kids when this company was, was huge, what company comes to mind when I talk about the moment? Kodak. Kodak. Kodak, right? Do you guys remember Kodak and the Kodak moment? Many of us were, were kids, but do you remember these commercials that Kodak used to always run on TV? Mm -hmm. These really schmaltzy commercials of the puppy dogs running through the grass and the children who would someday leave the empty nest. And my personal favorite commercial was the one where they had the grandma blowing out perhaps her last birthday candles. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real commercial, I'm not making this up. Why did Kodak spend billions of dollars and almost 100 years teaching people about the Kodak moment? Well, they were creating a mental association in consumers' minds that when you see a moment like this, this precious moment, before it disappears into the ether forever, capture it with a Kodak camera. Instagram did the same thing that, Co that took Kodak billions of dollars in advertising in almost 100 years. Instagram did with 12 people in 18 months by having users teach other users what the Instagram moment is all about. But of course, Instagram does things that the Kodak camera never could. So the more users use a product like Instagram, the more they pass through the four steps of Instagram's hook, the more they begin to associate using the product with other internal triggers. When they're feeling bored or lonely or feeling FOMO, what's FOMO? Fear of, Fear of missing out. It's actually in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as of last year. It's a real word, FOMO. We don't like this sensation that we might be missing out on something. Fear doesn't feel good. And the alleviation of that fear is found with this device in our pocket, with this app that we can easily access. And that fear suddenly disappears. Okay? There's that tight association. Make sense? All right. So that's a very, very quick introduction to triggers. There's a lot more to be said in the book about triggers and how to find your user's internal trigger. But let's move on for the sake of time. The next step of the hook is the action phase. The action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. Simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. I'm going to show you some habit forming products and I want you to see just how simple these actions are. You ready? What could be simpler than just scrolling on Pinterest? Just that act of scrolling. Or how about searching on Google? Or what about just pushing the play button? on YouTube, right? These extremely simple actions done in anticipation of a reward. And it turns out that there's a formula for predicting the likelihood of these singular behaviors. It comes to us from a researcher at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg, who posits that for any human behavior B, any human behavior, three things are required at the same time. Sufficient motivation, that's the M, Sufficient ability, ability is how easy or difficult something is to do, and a trigger must be present. We just talked about those triggers. So think about the power of this formula. For any human behavior, offline, online, doesn't matter. Any human behavior requires sufficient motivation, ability, and a trigger. We already talked about triggers, but let's talk about motivation and ability. So motivation, according to Edward DC, who you see here, the father of self-determination theory, DC tells us that motivation is the energy for action, how much we want to do a particular behavior. 
Now, this is an area of psychology that the researchers have been arguing about for decades and decades, but Fogg gives us these six basic levers that we can pull on to increase someone's motivation. Because all of us, as human beings, we seek pleasure, we avoid pain. We seek hope, and we avoid fear. We seek social acceptance, and we avoid social rejection. So every bit of advertising you've ever seen, every billboard, every television commercial, utilizes one or more of these six key motivators of human behavior. A lot more to be said about motivation, but let's move on to the A in B equals MAT. A stands for ability. Ability is how easy or difficult a particular behavior is to do. And here again, we have these six basic levers that we can pull on to make a behavior more likely to occur based on how, making it easier or more difficult to do. How much time something takes, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is required. Brain cycles, this is a big one when it comes to technology products because the harder something is to understand, the less likely that behavior is to occur. Social deviance says that we become more likely to do something when we see other people like us doing it. And finally, non-routine says that we become more likely to do something simply for the fact that we have done it before in the past. And this is why habits are such a big deal. Because the best predictor of what you will do in the past and what you will do in the future is what you have done in the past. Why? Because the more we do a particular behavioral pattern, the more we do a particular action, the easier it becomes and therefore become more likely to do it in the future. What do we call that? What's that called? It's called practice, right? The more we do it, the easier it gets, the more likely we are to do it in the future. So Fogg puts together these three basic elements of motivation, ability, and triggers on this graph that's really useful in a product development context. If you're building a product, you're building a website or an app or a service design, whatever it might be that you're building and you want people to do things, and darn it, they're not doing it. Right? People aren't clicking. They're not doing that particular behavior that you want them to do. You can ask yourself, does the user have sufficient motivation? High motivation, low motivation. Does the user have sufficient ability? If something is easy to do, it's way over here. If something is, easy, if, if something is hard to do, it's way over here. So easy, hard. If the user has sufficient motivation and the behavior is easy enough to do, they cross this blue threshold. And if a trigger is present, the behavior will occur. Every single time, online, offline, doesn't matter. Any human behavior. Let's make this concrete. I want you to think of a time in your life when a phone rang. Think of a time a phone rang in your life and you did not pick up the phone. Give me a reason why you didn't pick up the phone. Just shout it out. Didn't know the number. You didn't know the number. All right, so you're thinking it's a telemarketer, somebody you don't, maybe it's somebody you, you know, you're suspicious of, you don't want to pick up the call. That's an example of low motivation. So even if the, call, the phone is right there next to you, high ability, very easy to pick it up, even if you heard the phone ring, the trigger was present, if you lacked motivation, you didn't cross the threshold, and the behavior does not occur. What's another reason why you may not pick up a phone? Because your hands are You're in the shower, terrific. So you're in the shower, even if you say to yourself, oh, I really have to pick up that call, high motivation. Even if you heard the phone ring, the trigger was present, if it was too difficult to pick up the call, if your ability was way over here because you've got to dry off, run across the house to get the phone, you lacked ability, you don't do it. Eh, that's okay, I'll call that later. Don't like what? The person. What's that? If you don't like the person. Okay, great, so that'd be motivation, that'd be low motivation. What's a reason that has to do with the trigger? Reason that has to do with the trigger? To your talk. You're, okay, so you're, maybe you're listening to me talk right now and you put the phone on silent, right? You put the phone on silent and even if you really wanted to take that call, high motivation, even if the phone was right there next to you, you had plenty of ability to pick up the phone, you didn't hear the phone ring and no trigger was present. I can't tell you how many times I meet with companies in my consulting practice and they call me in for these big expensive design reviews and they show me every step of the user flow and I look at them and I look at the user flow and I say, where's the trigger? What do you want the user to do here? For every human behavior, we always need sufficient motivation, sufficient ability, and a trigger every single time. Every click, every move, every action. Okay, every single time. Let's take a, another case study here. How many of you use Twitter? A lot of Twitter users, terrific, tweet this. That'd be great, but maybe after. So let's take a look at Twitter over the years and see how Twitter has evolved 
using these principles of motivation, ability, and triggers. Here's the Twitter homepage back in 2009. Take a good look. Here's Twitter homepage 2009. Here it is in 2010. And here it is today. What's different? What do you see that's changed over the years? The layout. More yeah, what about more it? More graphics. Uh, yeah, more graphics. What else? What's different when it comes to motivation, ability, and triggers? A lot less calls to action. You notice this? Like, I don't know if you can see it there in the back, but back then, not only was there all these, this text, right, but there was also all these triggers around. Look, so what, when you clicked on what, it would take you to a different page to tell you all about what. And if you clicked why it was a trigger, and how it was a trigger, and watch a video is a trigger, sign is a trigger, click here is a trigger, click here is a trigger, and get started, join is a trigger. That is a ton of cognitive load for the user to figure out what the hell you want them to do. And in all three cases, what has always been the intended action? What does Twitter want people to do on this page? Sign in or sign up. That's always been the intended behavior. And what Twitter figured out was, by clearing the cognitive load, by making it easier for the user to just understand what you want them to do, they became more likely to do that intended behavior. Right? They were more likely to sign up, they would convert, and then go through the four steps of the hook. Now I know what someone's thinking. I bet that guy right there who just raised his hand, I know exactly your question. He's gonna ask me, yeah, but Nir, back in 2009, people needed to be told what Twitter was for, right? People needed what, why, and how, and watch a video and all that. Was that your question? It was, wasn't it? Nailed it. Mine too. Yours too. Here's what I found out. So in speaking to people who actually built this page, went over to Twitter for my class and for the book, actually speaking with these folks who watched this page evolve, who built this page out, what they told me they discovered was that they learned that people did not lack motivation. That even back in 2009, nobody came to Twitter by mistake. Nobody typed in TWITTR.com and said, oops, what's this? <laughs> that happened never. What they discovered was that even back in 2009, people intended to come to Twitter for a reason. They heard about it on the news or on Oprah or a friend told them about it. They had plenty of motivation. They didn't have to convince them to boost their motivation even higher. All they had to do was to increase their ability, make the intended behavior easier to do, and they could increase conversion and send people to the four steps of their hook. Yeah. Yes, um, under ability, what was the um, uh, the two lines that you had that were uh, non-routine and social deviancy? What, what are they? Yeah, what, what does, what that, does mean that mean? Under so social deviance says that we become more likely to do something when we see other people like us doing it. I'll give you an example. Okay. I was in a Starbucks in San Francisco where I live, uh, and I went to the restroom, and I go to the restroom, and there's two, two restrooms, there's a men's room, and there's a ladies room, and the men's room is, is uh, uh, empty, but the ladies' room has a line of three ladies waiting to use the restroom, right? Men's room is empty. It's single stall, by the way. There's not, you know, only one person can go in this restroom at a time. So the doors, you know, I, I check with the men's room, and I kind of feel bad. These three women have been standing here for I don't know how long, and they got to go just as bad as I do. And there's an empty bathroom that just happens to say men on it. Well, I look at the three ladies, and I look at the first one in line, and I say, you know what? Nobody else is in there. You've been standing here longer than I have. Why don't you go inside the men's room? She says, thank you very much. She goes inside. She comes out of the men's room. Who's next to go into that men's room? Me or the second woman in line who'd been waiting before I got there? The second woman in line. But what happened? All of a sudden, she saw that someone liked her. Another woman broke the seal. Now it's OK. That's social deviance. Now it's no longer deviant for me to do that behavior. When I see other people like me doing something, I become more likely to do it as well. Okay, what was the other one? Non-routine. Non-routine is this concept of practice. Simply for the fact that I have done it before in the past, the myelin and around my neurons in my brain have now made this behavior easier to do over time the more I practice it, and it becomes easier to do over time. Yeah, sure. Yes? I appreciate that in 09, that there were multiple false actions. They don't need that because right. the word of mouth and organic marketing people have heard of it. For other companies that are startups in the area that people don't know or haven't heard of, how do you deal with multi-channel calls to action? Right, so the lesson here is not, hey, everybody build a landing page just like Twitter. That's not the lesson, right? That's too specific. The lesson here is how can I take the intended behavior, no matter what that intended behavior is, 
and reduce the cognitive load. Make it as easy as possible for the user to do the thing I want them to do. You would not believe how just small changes in interface can greatly affect the likelihood of a behavior occurring. So that's, that's really the lesson here. It's not make a landing page like this. It's what is in your user's way among those six elements. What's in your user's way that makes that behavior difficult to do? And how can you make it easier? How can you increase the user's ability? Okay. Yeah. That one uh, a long time ago, most of you probably have not seen it. So you go to a book called The Big Red Fez, which is that little hat that one piece of the secret of the And uh, his deal was one banana per page, mm. ideally yellow or red. Mm. And it limited that. And the book is a classic. It's, right. it's still circulating out there. And he took the task, major Right. It made right. people do jump after jump after jump with no bananas right. uh, at all for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's 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 kind of common sense, right? Keep it simple, stupid, right? We all know the Kiss, uh, you know, acronym. It's it's for some reason hard to do when it comes to tech products because our product can do so much, right? The user needs to know about it because we can do it. So we should put all these features and buttons everywhere, right? Wrong. Because if you confuse the user too much, you get no behavior. It's not like you get more behavior; you get less behavior. So we want to make sure that we reduce the cognitive load as much as possible. All right, let's go now to the third step of the hook. So remember the trigger phase was all about figuring out the user's itch, right? Understanding those internal triggers using external triggers to prompt the user to action. The action is the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. Now the third step of the hook is the reward itself. To give the user what they came for, to scratch that itch. Now when we talk about rewards, we have to talk about the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which was first studied by two Canadian researchers by the name of Olds and Milner in the 1940s. And Olds and Milner discovered that this part of the brain had some very interesting properties. Namely, when they inserted electrodes inside the brains of their lab animals, and they allowed these lab animals to self-stimulate. They allowed these animals to push a little lever in order to send a tiny electrical current to this part of the brain. What they found was that the lab animals did so incessantly. They would run across painful electrified grids just to activate this part of the brain. They would forgo food and water just to continue to activate their nucleus accumbens. In later experiments done on people, they observed similar results. And in fact, when people were allowed to activate this part of the brain, they did this hundreds of times. People had to have these machines forcibly removed from them to get them to stop pressing on these buttons to activate this part of the brain. Well, it turns out we don't need electrodes to activate the nucleus accumbens. Your nucleus accumbens is activated every single day with things like luxury goods, sex, junk food, certain chemicals, and of course, right there in the center, technology. All of these things activate your nucleus accumbens every single day. Now, Olds and Milner and much of the psychology community believe that the purpose of the nucleus accumbens was to activate pleasure, right? Why else would lab animals and later people incessantly activate this part of the brain if it wasn't because it felt good, right? Not exactly. It turns out that what we now know about how the brain prompts us to action is not by creating pleasure per se, but creating what we call the stress of desire. Because what we now know about how the nucleus accumbens works is that the nucleus accumbens becomes most active, as you can see here from this fMRI study conducted at Stanford, that the nucleus accumbens becomes most active in anticipation of a reward. But when we actually get the thing we want, the thing that's finally gonna make us happy, the thing that's finally gonna make us feel good, that's when the nucleus accumbens becomes less active. So the way the brain gets us to act is by prompting this itch that we seek to scratch. And it turns out that there is a way to supercharge this stress of desire, this anticipatory response. Does anybody want to know how? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Please burn this knowledge. Don't tell us. Now you're acting like I'm doing it to you right now. 
So when I took that long pause and I asked you a question with a question mark at the end, some of you perked up. What's this guy doing next? Why did his cadence change? What's going on? And that bit of variability, that bit of mystery, that bit of the unknown, did you feel that itch? Did you feel that, okay, start talking, man. What's going on, right? That's this anticipatory response. It turns out that the unknown is fascinating. That the variability causes us to increase focus, increase engagement, and it's highly happy. <coughs> of course, this comes from the classic work of B.F. Skinner. Many of you might remember the work of B.F. Skinner from your Psych 101 class, the father of operant <laughs> conditioning. Skinner took these little pigeons, he put them in a box, he gave them this lever to peck at, this little disc to peck at, and every time the pigeons would peck at the disc, they would receive a little food pellet, a little reward. And at first, Skinner would give these, these pigeons a reward whenever they would peck at the disc. So peck at the disc, get a food pellet. And what Skinner basically proved was that he could train these pigeons to peck at this disc whenever they were hungry. But then Skinner did something a little bit different. Skinner introduced a variable reward. So sometimes the pigeons would peck at the disc, nothing would come out, nothing would happen. The next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times the pigeons pecked at this disc, increased when the behavior was given on a very, when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Why does this happen? Why does this occur? Because it turns out that variability spikes activity in the nucleus accumbens, creating this anticipatory, this wanting, this craving response. And so in all sorts of products that you find most habit forming, most engaging, the things that you find capture your attention and won't let go, you will find one or more of these three variable reward types. What I call rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. Let me introduce these to you briefly. First, let's talk about rewards of the tribe. These are about social rewards. These are things that feel good, that have this element of variability, a bit of the unknown, and come from other people. So the search for empathetic joy, feeling good because someone else feels good. Partnerships, cooperation, competition, all examples of variable rewards of the tribe. Now the best example I can think of online is of course social media. When we check our Facebook news feed, when we check the website, we're never quite sure what we're gonna get, right? What pictures might we see? What are the comments going to say? How many likes does something get? There's this broad range of variability associated with what we might see every time we open that app and check our news feed. Next comes rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt are about this primal search for food and other resources, and in modern society, we buy these things with money. So when many people think of variable rewards, they think about gambling, they think about slot machines, where the variable reward, what comes out of that slot machine, is of course currency, right? It's money, you're never quite sure what you're going to win, and that's a big part of what makes slot machines and gambling habit-forming and potentially addictive. But we find a very similar mechanic online. Let's talk about the psychology of the feed. Why is it that everything seems to have this feed mechanism? Have you noticed this over the past few years? Like everything online today has this feed? What is it about this feed? Let's take a look at Twitter's timeline. When I open up my Twitter feed, maybe the first tweet isn't interesting, the second isn't interesting, but oh, maybe the third or fourth is interesting. And what do I have to do to get more of these rewards? What do I have to do? Just keep scrolling. So this scrolling and scrolling is very similar to pulling out a slot machine searching and searching and never done searching for these variable information rewards, these rewards of the hunt. Finally, this brings me to the last type of variable reward, rewards of the self. These are, are this is about self-achievement. Variable rewards of the self are things that feel good, that have this element of variability, but don't come from other people and aren't about the search for material or information rewards. These are things that feel good in and of themselves. The search for mastery, completion, competency, and control. Intrinsically, pay, intrinsically pleasurable behaviors. Good example online is gameplay. So when I play Candy Crush or the Kardashian game or any number of different games, even though I'm not playing with other people necessarily, even though I'm not really winning anything in terms of material rewards, there's still something pleasurable about getting to the next level, the next accomplishment, the next achievement. Rewards the self. Now, I know what somebody's thinking. Somebody's thinking, yeah, but Nir, you know, I don't really play games. This doesn't really apply to me. 
Well, I bet you play this game every day. <laughs> Look familiar? Checking those unread messages. Finishing the to-dos on your to-do list. Or my personal favorite, the one that always gets me is when I see my, my uh, home screen and I see that one app that has this little notification that just makes me open it so I can clear it away. <laughs> right? Some of you know that feeling too. This sense of mastery, completion, competency, and control. All rewards of the self. Here's a bit of warning. Now that you know about variable rewards, I don't want people to walk away and say, great, now I'm going to make my product super habit forming. I'll just put all kinds of variable rewards in the product. It'll be great. Let me just prompt you with this word of warning that variable rewards are not a free pass. That fundamentally, there has to be a connection between the variable reward and the internal trigger. So if the internal trigger is boredom, well, then the variable reward has to entertain. If the internal trigger is loneliness, seeking connection, well then the variable reward damn well better connect people together. Because the point of the variable reward phase is to give people what they came for, to scratch the user's itch and yet leave them wanting more. A bit of mystery around what they might find the next time they engage with the product. Which brings me to the last step of the hook, the investment phase. The investment phase of the hook is probably the most overlooked. Probably the area of the hook that people have the most room for, for improvement. The investment phase is where the user puts something into the product for a future benefit. It's not about immediate gratification. That's what the action phase is all about, immediate reward. The investment phase is about a future benefit. It's something the user does to put value into the product for a future benefit. The point of the investment phase, what the investment phase does, is increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. And it does this in two ways. The first way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is by loading the next trigger. So, for example, when I use WhatsApp or any number of other messaging services, and I send someone a message, there's no immediate gratification. Right? I don't get any points, I don't get any badges. Nothing really happens when I send someone a message. But when I do that, when I invest in the platform by sending this message, I'm very likely to get a reply. And what comes in every reply? This little jewel icon, which is an example of an external trigger prompting me to use the product again and pass through the four steps of their hook. Okay? So the first way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass is by loading the next trigger. The next way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass is by storing value. Now storing value is a big deal. Storing value is the reason that I love working in technology products. Because unlike things made of atoms, things made out of bits have, very, have some very different properties. Things made out of atoms, things, things in the physical world, like these chairs, these tables, your phones, your computers, all of these things in the physical world, they depreciate with use. They lose value with wear and tear. But habit-forming technologies should do the opposite. Habit-forming technologies should appreciate with use. They should get better the more we use them. And they do this because of this principle of stored value. So for example, the more content I put into iTunes, the better it becomes as my one and only music library. The more data I give to a site like Mint.com or Pinterest or any number of other sites, the more data I give these companies about my preferences and tastes, the better they become for me. Right? The product is tailored for my needs. So if you were to log into my Pinterest account, it actually wouldn't be that interesting for you, right? Because it's been tailored based on my data. It's stored value for me with use. Followers, the more followers someone has, the better the product becomes. So for example, on Twitter, if Twitter tomorrow sent out an email that said, I'm sorry, Twitter is no longer free. Now you have to start paying to use Twitter. Who is more likely to send them a check? Someone with 10 followers or someone with 10,000 followers? Of course, it's going to be the person with 10,000 followers. They've accrued all this stored value in the form of these followers. And finally, reputation. So on sites like TaskRabbit or Airbnb or eBay, my reputation is a form of stored value that I can literally take to the bank. 
because my reputation on these platforms dictates what I can charge for my goods and services. And how likely am I to leave one of these platforms after I've accrued all this value in the form of my reputation? It's kind of hard to do, right? It's kind of hard to leave. It's all of a sudden sticky, even if there's a, 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 another competitor that comes out. Yeah, but I've stored all this value in the form of my reputation. So that's it. That's the four basic steps of these hooks. These experiences designed to connect your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. And it's through these successive cycles, through these hooks, that user preferences are shaped, that tastes are formed, and that these habits take hold. Now, that was a lot of information. I told you it would be. I condensed a lot of information into a very short period of time. There's a lot more information in the book. It's a 250 page book. Uh, so you can always go check that out later. But here's the most important slide. Here's, if there's one slide that, that I'd like you to remember, it's if you're trying to build a habit forming product, if your business model depends on habits, here's the five fundamental questions you need to be able to answer. Number one, what is the internal trigger that your product is addressing? What's the user's itch? Number two, what's the external trigger that gets the, your user to the product? Number three, what's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward? And how can you make it simpler? Is the reward fulfilling? and yet leaves the user wanting more. And then finally, the investment. What's the bit of work the user does to increase the likelihood of the next pass? Now, before we take some questions, there's one more thing I'd like to talk about. And that is the morality of manipulation. Because I'm guessing that some of you during this presentation were thinking to yourself, you know, is this okay? Is this, is this kosher to do to people, to use their hidden psychology to change their behavior in ways they may not necessarily suspect? And if you had that reaction, bravo. I think that is the appropriate response to learning about the psychology of habit design. Because let's face it, folks, anytime we are designing a behavior for our users to meet our ends in mind, that is a form of manipulation. So we have to be very careful about how we apply these techniques because the technology that we're building are the tools and products that people take to bed with them every night. It's the first thing people reach for in the morning before they even say hello to their loved ones. And as Ian Bogo said, our technologies are quite possibly becoming the cigarettes of this century. So what responsibility do we have as product designers, as engineers, as entrepreneurs, as investors, what responsibility do we have to use the psychology of habits for good? Well, I encourage you to find one of the world's problems to fix. You know, that is one thing that we have no shortage of. I encourage you to use the psychology of habit design to help people live happier, healthier, more connected, more productive lives by using habits for good. I encourage you, to borrow from the words of Gandhi, to build the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you very much. One more thing before I please, please. One more thing. So, I need a favor. If everybody could take their phones, can you raise your phones up for me for a minute? Raise them up high where I can see them. Yep, great, raise them up high, terrific, terrific. One, I wanna grab a picture of everybody, terrific, thank you. And two, I just increased your ability to take the intended behavior, which is to go to this URL, www.opinion2.us, now that you have your phones in your hand. I very much value your feedback. I'm constantly improving this presentation based on feedback. I would love to know what you thought. Very, very short survey, it's only five questions, a bunch of big radio buttons, take you all 30 seconds. As soon as you click submit, on that survey, you will be given a link to my SlideShare page where you can have all the slides you just saw. Okay, so that's the reward. So I, I practice what I preach here. So, uh, yeah, and with that, I'm happy to take some questions. All right, again, a big round of applause over here. Really appreciate it. All right, so um, we, have, we have a good amount of time for some questions. So we're going to spend uh, 15, 20 minutes. So what I'm going to do here is um, I actually have one or two to start. And sure. then a couple have already uh, submitted them around Twitter. And then what I'll do, if you just raise your hands, I'll come over to you so you can actually speak into the he's, mic. He's super eager. Yeah, I'm, I'll get you out. You're, you're on my list. Um, and 
Uh, if we can just have the questions go through the mic, that'd be great. There is a live stream going on, and there are recording it, so that way everyone will be able to hear. Because uh, not all of us are not all of us are as loud as you, so appreciate that. So um, one of the first things I wanted to talk about, or have you kind of address, was um, you talked, um, I think, in your book about the need if you're going to build a new product to have it be better than the alternative. In fact, I think you said it needs to be nine times nine x bigger. So could you talk a little bit about that and the importance of? Um, coming up with a better solution for uh, producing something new that just happens to have some different different approaches to it? Right, so that's, that's actually not my number. That was an HBS study that found that uh, products, particularly in the enterprise space, can't just be a little bit better, right? They have to be a lot better. And so in this respect, it brings up a really interesting topic in that you know, habits are a competitive advantage. And so habits have this, have this uh, problem in a way because if you're an incumbent with a habit, that's terrific. If your product is habit forming as an incumbent, that's wonderful because it's a huge barrier to other people coming in and taking that habit away. Let me give you an example. Can you raise your hand for me if you've searched with Google in the past 24 hours? Who searched with Google? <laughs> All right, almost everybody in the room, I'm guessing. Bing, who searched with Bing in the past 24 hours? Bing. So, one Microsoft employee is in the room, everybody. <laughs> so what's going on here? Why is Google, almost every person in the room has used Google and only one person has used Bing? What's going on? It's because Google's better, right? Google's just a far superior product. Their algorithms and the whiz bangs and whatever the geniuses in Mountain View are doing, just better, right? No. Wrong. It turns out that when you strip away the branding and you show people the search results head to head, people can hardly tell them apart. It's about a 50-50 split in people's preferences for Bing over Google. And did you know that Bing will actually pay you to search with Bing? I, I have no affiliation with Bing whatsoever, but they will actually pay you money <laughs> to search with Bing instead of Google. But you wouldn't know that, would you? Right? We don't even consider whether there's other better alternatives because the cold hard truth is that when it comes, particularly in the technology space, that the best product does not always win. The best product doesn't always win. It turns out many times the most habit forming, the stickiest product is the one that succeeds in the marketplace. So there's only a few ways to steal, so to speak, to, to get your competition's habits, and it's very hard to do. I mean, that's why companies want to be, be habits in users' life, because they know that it's a huge, uh, it's a huge competitive advantage to have a stronghold on a, on a customer's habit. So there's three ways, to answer your question, there's only three ways to take someone else's habit away. So if you're building a product that's competing with boredom with Facebook, right, or loneliness with Facebook, or boredom with YouTube, or whatever it might be, these big emotional internal triggers that you want to compete with, how do, you, how do you win that customer over? There's only three ways. The first way is to find a way to get the user to pass through the hook with greater velocity, right? So if you can do trigger, action, reward, investment faster than the competitor, you have a chance of winning. And that typically comes from an innovation in the action phase. If you can figure out some way to take work out of the equation to make it easier for user to do that behavior, you've got a shot. And if you think about it, that's kind of the history of all technology. From the cotton gin to the iPhone, every technology shortens the, the distance between the need and the reward, right? So that's way number one, is velocity through the hook. The second way is the frequency of passing through the hook. So one is velocity through the hook, the next is the frequency throughout user's day. And that typically happens when there's an interface change. So when we went from desktops to laptops, to mobile, and as of yesterday, wearables, right? You also saw the, the news around the Apple Watch. Every time there's this interface change, there's this break, and the habit deck gets reshuffled. And all the habits we had on these past interfaces now need to port over to these new interfaces. And these new interfaces, you notice what's happening is that technology shrinks, it becomes more portable, and now we have the opportunity to do these behaviors throughout our day. And that's why a company like Facebook, for example, had to buy Instagram, had to buy WhatsApp, because it was a product that was used more frequently throughout the user's day and was starting to suck away some of those habits that were taking place on a, on a product like Facebook. So number one is velocity through the hook, number two is frequency of passing through the hook, and number three is making the reward more rewarding. And it needs to be a lot more rewarding. A reward needs to be more rewarding. So that third step of the hook, the variable reward phase, if you can make a product that is somehow significantly more rewarding, scratches the user's itch better than your competitor in a significant way, there you have a chance 
again, of, of capturing that habit. Let me give you an example. Uh, how many of you use Snapchat? Snapchat users? Okay, good, a lot of you, terrific. I want you to put yourself in the mindset, I want you to imagine that you have just received a message, two, I'm sorry, two messages at the same time, two messages at the same time. One message just came to you from Facebook, from uh, Messenger or something, so you just received a notification from Facebook. The next message at the same exact time is from Snapchat. Somebody just sent you a Snapchat notification. Which one are you gonna open? Snapchat. Snapchat. Why? Why? Facebook will be there, and it's probably your Aunt Matilda on Facebook at this point, right? It's not that interesting. As opposed to Snapchat, what's special about a Snapchat message? It disappears, right? And what happens to my discretion as the sender around what I'm going to send when I know that message is ephemeral? Well, I'm more likely to send things that are flirty, that are silly, that are funny, <coughs> and now all of a sudden the receiver gets the reward that is suddenly more rewarding. So if I get two messages, one from Aunt Matilda on Facebook or from somebody I've been flirting with on Snapchat, where is the reward more rewarding? And so that's, of course, why uh, Zuckerberg offered a billion or three billion dollars for Snapchat and was rebuffed. Right. Awesome. Uh, next question here. You, you mentioned this at the start there. Um, enterprise applications. Yeah. We talked a lot about Snapchat, about Instagram. There was one of the one of the questions on Twitter, and it's also on my list too. Of some of your favorite examples of you know, B two B enterprise type apps that kind of follow the framework right. that you'd said as good examples to study. Right. So um, first and foremost, not every business needs a habit. Okay, so this is not magic pixie dust that applies to every business that you sprinkle on and you'll have you know, a, a huge uh, billion dollar unicorn. It's not the way this works. And that's, good, that's a good thing. Not every product needs a habit. You can create a lot of value, you can create a great company without a habit. You just need to figure out another way to bring users back. So you can bring users to your company through advertising, through search engine optimization. In fact, you can have a taco stand, right? You can have a physical storefront to bring people to your place of business. However, if your company requires unprompted engagement, if your product requires, the business model requires habits, just like the companies we talked about earlier of Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and WhatsApp and Pinterest and, and companies like Slack and GitHub and Stack Overflow, these companies require habits. They would go out of business if they had to pay for advertising to bring people back time and time again. So that's the first test. Does your product, whether it's enterprise or consumer, actually need a habit? If you don't, there's still a lot to be learned from consumer psychology. That's still great. There's a lot you can figure out to make the transaction easier. A lot from consumer psychology you can take away. You just don't have to do it all. Now, if your product needs a habit, whether it's enterprise or consumer, then you have to do it all. Then you have to have all four steps of the hook. So in the enterprise space, there's many companies in the enterprise space that just don't need habits. For example, if your product is sold top down to some committee, Right? If it's, you gotta go meet with the IT people and then you gotta go in front of the IT committee and then they buy your product and they tuck it into some server farm somewhere and they never actually use it, you don't need habits. Right? That is, this is not helpful for that type of product. However, if you're the type of enterprise company that's building the usage base from the ground up, think GitHub, think Salesforce, think uh, Slack, these companies that are building products where the frontline employees use the product, then the manager would say, hey, everybody's using this product, where do I send my check? Then the same rules apply. Doesn't matter if it's enterprise or consumer, the habit formation process is exactly the same. So I wrote an article actually about Slack as, as a great example of a company that's doing really well nowadays uh, as the fastest growing enterprise app in history because of how uh, effective their hook is. So that's one that, that comes to mind, but of course there's others as well. All right, great. Now, the last Twitter question, I'll start circling the room here. And uh, you already somewhat brought it up. Um, it was thoughts, uh, especially in the vein of maybe addictive habits on the, the Apple Watch and, and wearables. Yeah, so um, I think I think that because of that interface change, there's going to be several multi-billion dollar opportunities, hopefully maybe somebody in this room will figure it out, uh, created by this new interface change. Because you know, if you think about it, um, does anybody know how old the App Store is, the Apple App Store. How old is the Apple App Store? Seven years. It's about seven years old. Think about this, 2008, okay? 2008, you, you all remember 2008, right? That wasn't that long ago. And yet, think about all the behaviors that in 2007, we could not have foreseen, that have now become part of our daily habits, our daily routines, since just seven years. That's nothing, right? That's a blink of an eye. So what's gonna happen in another seven years? Right? What's going to be possible? What triggering opportunities might suddenly be available to us 
with this new interface, there's going to be a lot of interesting things created because now there's new triggering opportunities that occur more frequently throughout the user's day-to-day -day life. So I, I think it's going to be, I don't know if it's going to be Apple, you know, the, the first Apple Watch or the second Apple Watch or the Google Watch. I don't know who's going to win or what apps at this point are going to be the big winners. It will for sure have a profound impact. It's coming. It's inevitable. As will Google Glass. I mean, people kind of think Google Glass has gone and forgotten. This iteration, you know, these ideas tend to, to come back up after a few years. We know either it's going to be in our generation or our kids' generation or our kids' kids' generation, there will be some type of heads-up display interface. It's coming at some point. And every time there's that interface change, there's new habit-forming opportunities. Yes, eager gentleman back. Uh, Mir, thank you so much for sharing this knowledge with us. Thank you. My question is in regards to strategies. My, uh, in particular, when we're dealing with uh, difficult personas or we have just like one website page and we're dealing with a multitude of different profiles there, how is strategies for dealing with that? Of examples, right? For example, buttons. Consumer-wise, they do better, for example, in green, right? Or something that is aligned to your brand right. versus in a B2B space, orange button seems to be prevalent, right? How do we resolve that when I have multiple personas in there? Yeah. Or let me give you a little bit more complicated situation in B2B. You have the C-suite, so CXO browsing your page, and this is the buyer's journey, right? So we're solving for that. And then we have the CFO that is looking for particular keywords or positioning in the page versus the CMO is looking for other words or other you know elements in there. How do we go about resolving other than you know uh, the end approach or I do this for the uh, the or approach right? I do this or that. Right. Ideas around that. Well, first of all, what, what's wrong with testing? Testing works great. I'm just saying that I have one page and I want to maximize the impact for everyone involved, right? Right. So uh, I would like you know more than just choosing one out of the DAB methodology. Right. So um, unfortunately, if it's a landing page where you haven't collected information about the user, they haven't passed through the hook yet. It's difficult to customize it based on the individual. Now, what these companies do that's brilliant is that the investment phase is all about collecting data about your behavior. You know, every time you like something, every time you pin something, every time you favorite something. I'm collecting data. Every time you click on anything, I'm collecting data about you so that I can tailor that experience in the future. So that's one way, is that you, you literally change the experience per user based on what they have done in the past, based on the data you've collected about their past behavior. Now, that being said, you know, a lot of these questions, I, I get sometimes questions of, you know, what's the right color or what's the white, you know, how, how should this look? And many times those type of questions are things that should just be tested. So does everybody know the Lean Startup methodology? Who's heard of Lean Startup? Pretty much everybody these days, right? Like Eric Brees and Steve Blank. Does everybody know the three steps of the Lean Startup methodologies? What are they? Build, build, measure, learn, right? We all know build, build, measure, learn. That's a heck of a lot better than how we used to build software, right? We'd stick a bunch of engineers in the room. In a room, we'd say, okay, you can come out in six months when you're done. They'd put a product in out of the world. Sometimes it was a year. Sometimes it was always over budget and, and over time. And uh, typically, nobody wanted to buy that product. But now we're in light. Right now we do lean startup. Right now we ask people what they want. We do customer development to hear what they want. But my contention is that that's not good enough. We still have to do that. We still have to do build, measure, learn. We still have to test. What I want to do is to help entrepreneurs have some kind of framework to help them deal with all the consumer psychology which drives user behavior in ways they can't articulate. There's all sorts of things that drive our behaviors, but the consumer can never tell you drives their behavior. And so this is a framework before you spend all that money on figuring out which feature we should build, right? Because remember, the most expensive part of build, measure, learn is what? Where does all the blood, sweat, and tears and money all go? Building, right? The building is the expensive part. Measuring and learning, that's fun and easy. So what, I, what we always struggled with at my last startup was that we always had this trouble of, you know, what do we build? Do we build what the consumer, the loudest consumer says we should build? Do we build what the VCs say we should build? Do we build what we think is a good idea? So this is a model to help you figure out what to build next. It doesn't mean you, you, you can get away without testing. You still have to do build, measure, learn. The idea is that based on this methodology, by plugging your experience through these hooks, you can figure out how to build the right thing sooner 
and hopefully save yourself a lot of time and money. So do you think you'd be able to give an example of one specific use case or one specific case in which you implemented a strategy that had an overwhelmingly ex exceptionally positive result? For example, a question that you did not expect to have such an, a large impact on a user study or something of that sort. Uh, well, there's so there's there's a lot of folks that uh, wait. What do you mean the last part? I, got, I thought I understood your question. Then the last part I didn't understand. What do you mean a question? So I'm saying it's like a very specific case of something that somebody using the hook. Yeah, that's, oh, that okay. you didn't think that would have such a large impact on the trajectory of a product. Right. So um, the book only came out in November. Uh, it's still very very new, and I, I work with several clients. Unfortunately, I, I can't talk about those specific clients or what we've done uh, with the user experience. Uh, if it's been it's been good. I mean, my goal is to teach people the methodology and then watch them implement, it, which is terrific. I can't talk about my own investment, so I do angel investment. I look for companies that have the hook in mind. The best example as of late is uh, is Product Hunt. Uh, so Ryan Hoover was working at another company uh, before he, he he started Product Hunt. He sent me a, an email that said, "Hey, I, you know, I've been blogging and and I put you on this list of 13 people I want to meet in 2013." So he had all these like you know people in Silicon Valley that he wanted to meet, uh, and 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 I was one of them. And I said, you know what, I'm I'm right here. Like just come by, we'll we'll have a burger. And so we sat down together. And he said, hey, look, I really like what you're doing. I've been reading your articles on TechCrunch. Like I really dig it. How can I help you? And so he helped me take my my articles that were just you know blog posts and put them into this book and figure out where we were missing some holes and where we needed more case studies, etc. And then the next thing that Ryan Hoover does after helping me with the book. Is start product hunt, and Ryan Hoover and his team deserve all the credit, 110 percent of the credit they deserve for actually doing it. It's much easier to sit up here and pontificate about theories. They deserve the credit for actually doing it. But he used the hook model in mind in building that product, and of course, it's the toast of Silicon Valley these days. Uh, he was named, you know, Inc's uh, 30 under 30. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz just invested 6.2 million dollars. I'm also an investor in the company, thankfully. So that's an example of a company that implemented the hook and is, is doing very, very well. There's others, of course. Uh, there's a company I invested in called Seven Cups of Tea, which was in, was in the Y Combinator class a few weeks ago, uh, a, few, uh, a few classes ago. That's a, company, a great example of a company that's doing uh, good by creating these habits. So Seven Cups of Tea has these hooks built into it, and it's a company that is serving people who uh, need to talk. So it's, it's trying to displace, it's trying to disrupt the psychotherapy market. So if you're a soldier with PTSD, if you're a parent of a child who has a disability and you need someone to talk to, as opposed to going to a therapist, think about, think about that, that uh, ability curve of going to a therapist. Who do I go to? There's social anxiety about going to someone. How do I schedule with them? Money is a factor. All these barriers. Well, this, this, this product, Seven Cups of Tea, with one push of the button, if you need to talk to somebody, you're instantly connected for free with someone who, who is, a, is a trained listener. Now the kicker is that uh, they, actually the people who are the listeners were the people who were listened to before. In the process of becoming habituated to being listened to, you actually learn how to listen. And those are the people who get better. So by creating these hooks, by creating these habits in people's day-to-day -day lives, they actually found that they get better 80% as well as very expensive psychotherapy. So that's a great example, I think, of a, of, a, of a hook doing good. What? Oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> so um, engagement, effort, reward, and self. So let's take all those concepts. And isn't it true that the science shows that sometimes requiring greater effort and engagement uh, ends up in a reward that is more satisfying and therefore uh, more likely to cause habit. Uh, so the, an example is what's called incongruity theory, where you confront somebody with something that they are not familiar with, and when you do that, it forces them to try to resolve the incongruity in their mind, and when they are able to do it, there's, there's a reward. Just the fact that they did it and they can take credit for having resolved that incongruity right. 
there's a reward. How does that fit into so this? So in the investment phase of the hook, there's this, this, the whole idea of the investment phase is small bits of work that the user does to increase the likelihood of returning. And so we know it loads the next trigger, we know it has this effect of, of storing value. What I didn't talk about, I didn't have time to talk about the presentation, but in the book is the cognitive side of what's going on. And there's a lot of research that shows that when we put effort into something, when we invest in something, when we make it our own, we value it more highly. So uh, Dan Ariely calls this the IKEA effect. <coughs> if you've ever gone to IKEA, you bought some, some crappy table for 30 bucks and you build it, all of a sudden that crappy table, look what I did. Right? Look, I made that table. And even though it's a crappy table, you'll take it with you from college to your first home to your second home because I made that table. Right? You put labor into it. You endow it with value. And that's kind of part of this cognitive side of why investments make us like things more. Hi. So you mentioned um, several products that solve um, user problems. But sometimes some of these products create derivative problems. Um, a good example, I think, is Facebook. Um, it solves social failures, but um, you know, some would argue that it's created derivative failures um, and caused, for example, like younger users to um, consider other platforms. So, have you, has your research um, sort of addressed or evaluate some of those problems, and how have you seen um, companies yeah. solve them? So, I, I love this question. I think the, the morality question, thank you for that question. This is uh, a super important topic. Let me, let me tell you the two reasons I wrote this book. The number one reason I wrote this book is because, as a product maker, I've, I've started two companies, and I remember how frustrating it is when you want people to do a behavior, when you want them to use a product that you know will be good for them. And for some reason, they won't use the product. That's extremely frustrating, extremely difficult. And so, the first reason I wrote this book was to help entrepreneurs, was to help product people make products to help people form healthy habits, right? The vast, I, I almost meet with, almost never do I meet with a company that says, that comes to me and says, you know what, people are way too engaged with our product, how do we get them to dial it back? Right? That never, almost never happens. People are coming to me because they say, look, we have these healthy habits we want to form in users' lives, it's gonna make their life better. How do we, but nobody gives a shit. How do we get them to engage? And so that's what the majority of this work is for. That's, that's who I wrote this book for. However, I'll let you in on a little secret. The book is a bit of a Trojan horse. Because you buy the book thinking, how do I build habit-forming products? But then you can't read the book and not ask yourself, wait a minute, is this being done to me? Like, how does this affect my life? Right? Are there hooks in the behaviors that, that I see myself engaging with with little or no conscious thought in ways that may or may not serve me? And so the second reason I wrote this book is because I believe the world is becoming a potentially more addictive place. And if we don't understand how these things hook us, if we don't understand that this is not an accident, that these things are designed to be engaging, if we don't know that, if we don't know the mechanics of how these things work, we can't do anything about it. We think it's us, and it's not. Well, at least it's not all of us. It's partially the fact that these products are optimized and studied to be engaging. So that's, that's the second reason I wrote this book. And I am just as much of an advocate for creating healthy habits in users' life, lives as I am for breaking hooks that don't serve us. So if you look at my blog at nearandfar.com, I constantly go between these two sides of here's how to create habits and here's how to break habits. And I'll be the first to admit that I struggle with this. And in fact, I think this is the struggle of our generation. Because remember, you know, the last generation, so for when, when I applied to college, maybe some of you on the older side of the room might remember this. When, when we applied to college, every college would send us a brochure that said how many books they have in their library, right? Come to this school because we have 50,000 books. No, we have 60,000 books. Who gives a shit, right? It's totally irrelevant today. That used to matter back then because universities and colleges were the keepers of information, right? But now information is not scarce. Right? We're drowning in information. There's too much information. Today, the scarce resource, and I think the differentiator between who succeeds and who fails, is attention. Is the ability to sit down and focus on doing quality work. And the only way we can sustain our attention is to break these damn hooks where we don't want them in our life. And so if we don't understand how technology controls our behaviors, control, then technology will control our behaviors. It's only when we understand how to break these habits that we can do something about it. 
we have time for a couple more here. Awesome. Um, so you talked about the idea of stored value, and I noticed a lot of the types that you were going through were all explicit, so status, ratings, and things like that. Um, from the perspective of the hook model, is there value in sort of implicit things yes. like personalization if the user doesn't actually realize that they're getting that in return? Right, absolutely. So there's there's oh, there's actually three types. So there's, there's uh, explicit stored value where I'm doing something that I know makes the product better with time. That's probably the most useful, right? that's the most effective form of stored value. There's also the fact that the data that's collected passively, that the product gets better and better in, with use even though I don't recognize it. So for example, if you use Google and you're not in incognito mode, you're actually tailoring the product for your needs. So if you go to in incognito mode and you type in the exact same search query, you'll get different results because the data you put into the product based on your past search queries and what you click changes the product with use. It makes it better and better with time. Uh, and then, and then the, the, the third uh, form of, of user investment in work is when we see a computer doing work for us. I say computer to mean technology. There was this great study that showed that when you show people a progress bar, so they did this on a flight uh, search, uh, on a, I think it was on Expedia, they did this test, where they showed this search bar that Expedia is looking and looking, you know, you've seen these before, right? Like progress, work is being done. When the user saw, took time out of their search, right, when they were sitting there waiting for the work to be done, they were more likely to continue with that experience versus giving them instant results. So we also value a robot doing the work for us. We still <laughs> espouse value and labor as something that, that's, that's worthy of investing in. Yes, please. What, what made WhatsApp so much more successful than the multitude of competitors in, in, in other such products? Right. So um, when it comes to figuring out why one product does better than the other, it doesn't necessarily mean that engagement was the magic bullet. Let's, let's be clear. Um, engagement is only one piece of the puzzle. So everything I told you today was just about user engagement. But there are three things you need for any successful business. And this is kind of my quick and dirty business model uh, analysis. So when I'm looking at a company to work with or to invest in, I always screen them based on these three criteria. I call it GEM, G-E-M. Every business model requires growth, engagement, and monetization. So when I invest in a startup, I look for two out of the three with a plan for the third. Nobody has all three. If you have all three, you're not a startup anymore. You're a validated business. Is there, so, is there something like the colors or the layout? Or I don't think the, it's that simple. So, what, what, I mean, why? It could there be dozens of competitors in right. the market. So, in the engagement side of the equation is this stuff. Because each of these three things is necessary but not sufficient. So, if you've got amazing engagement but no way to grow, you've only got 10 users but they use it every day and you can't figure out how to grow, you've got nothing. If you've got growth but no engagement, you're a leaky bucket. You've still got nothing. So each of these three things is necessary but not sufficient. And what differentiates one product from another is sometimes it's engagement, sometimes the product is stickier, sometimes it's growth. So in the case of, of WhatsApp, I wasn't you know, super close to the team or anything. One of the things that they did particularly well was they grew faster than their competitors and network effects, as you know, is a very important factor in what makes a messaging service. Why? There's a hundred reasons. So there's with growth, there's no magic bullets with growth. Growth is a war of attrition. It's doing one thing after another after another better. There's, no, there's never... Big now looks prettier than Google. But who uses it? Oh, well now it's too late. Why is, why is it now too late for Bing on the desktop search? Come on, <laughs> have it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Google's got you. It's your default search bar, and it's what you're yeah, used to. And you, you used to be Yahoo. Yahoo. Well, you used to be Yahoo or Excite or AOL, and they're right. Right. Two more quick questions. All right. So, one place where you try to get behavior change in business is with salespeople, uh -huh. and um, at least in my experience, I found that it's better to have the reward be uh, fixed, in the sense that the salesperson sells a product, they get kind of a specific outcome and they know it in advance. Why is it, I mean, a variable outcome in sales will kill you, they, 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 won't, they won't have behavior change, they won't sell the new product, or at least I've not been able to get it done through contests and things like that. I, it depends on what behavior you're trying to uh, motivate. So uh, with the sales applications, and I'm, I'm no expert in sales motivation, so let me just say up front that 
it depends on what kind of behavior you're trying to incentivize. So if you're trying to, to incentivize uh, a behavior that is kind of uh, routine, right? It's the same behavior time and time again. Just do the same behavior time and time again. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter how fast you do it, just do the same. So pick up the phone and cold call again and again and again. That might not be an aspect uh, that, that, that drives, uh, that you necessarily need a variable reward for. Although I would argue that if that thrill of the chase for salespeople, right? So the best salespeople that I've, I've met are the ones who love that hunt, the deal, the variability of can I close this, this uh, sale, that of course is in their reward package, right? They make more when they sell more. Um, so I, I think that's, that's part of the psychology of why people last in that industry, is this no, variability. Yeah, I agree with that. And if, sorry. Well, it's just that uh, but they, they respond better to a specific outcome than like a contest or something that is variable. Right. I, I sell this, maybe I get a reward. Well, so that, that brings up like agency. This and I know I get the reward, and I definitely, right. this is the lack of case works better. So agency is a big deal. Agency is how much control I have over a certain situation. And if I don't feel like I'm in control of the situation, so uh, a lot of times people try and do gamification. Does everybody know what gamification is? Using game-like mechanics in non-gaming environments. And they put in points and badges and leaderboards, and this always happens when you put in a leaderboard. You get this amazing effect where the people at the top of the leaderboard, super engaged. Everybody else doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because if I'm not one, two, or three, what's my chances of being one, two, or three? This goes back to Foursquare. Everybody remember Foursquare? What happened with Foursquare after a while is that if you couldn't be the mayor, if you weren't close to being the mayor, everybody else kind of gave up. I'm never going to be the mayor because that guy's always more, you know, coming here more than I am. And they gave up. Why? Because they lost agency. It was never possible. Even though it was variable, they didn't have any control over the situation. Yeah, my question is a little bit more tactical. We've definitely been able to, at the company I work for, implement a lot of the stuff in the hook model. I was wondering, as you advise companies, as you look and help companies, maybe it's product time, uh, the more triggers you build, let's say you start off with an external trigger in email, uh, the more unsubscribes you get. So how do you make sense of seeing uh, uh, incremental engagement improvement, but also on the flip side, you see people uh, bailing. Do you just say, forget you, and mm -hmm. focus on the people that are engaged? Yeah, so the, the first thing is to test like crazy, right? You can you can do A-B tests, you, and the best we know is to do cohort analysis. That's kind of the best of breed solutions, is to do cohort analysis to see who sticks around, who stays engaged. But here's the rule about good triggers. So the difference between magic and spam is context. The difference between magic and spam is context. If you get a message that's not relevant to you, it's, not, it's spam. But if you get a message that's perfectly timed, wow, that's incredibly helpful. And so the, the rule here about sending effective triggers is the closer you can couple when the user receives the external trigger to the moment they feel the internal trigger. So if you can closely couple those, the closer those are together, the more magical it is, right? That's why the watch is gonna be such a big deal because we're gonna be able to trigger people in new ways based on geospatial locations, based on heartbeat, based on all kinds of new information that we're gonna get out of this device to closely, tr uh, to closely um, connect the external trigger with the internal trigger. Let me give you an example. Uh, last year, uh, the Yahoo News Digest won app of the year. Now a lot of apps are doing this technique, but they were one of the first news apps, and there's a thousand news apps out there. And every news app, many of them still do this, they believe that they should send you notifications every time there's breaking news. Right? The, uh, the theory is, the old school mentality around news is, news is important all the time. So you want to be informed all the time with another trigger telling you, check the New York Times, check the New York Times, check the New York Times. Well, that turns out to be super annoying because sometimes I just want to work. Leave me alone for a little bit. So users were turning that off. Well, Yahoo News Digest, and there's another app uh, called Smart News that does this. There's actually several now that do this. They figured out that we're, just, we're going to trigger users less, but we're going to trigger them just at specific times of the day. So they started sending triggers. When is a user most likely to want, the, to want to read the news? When are they most likely to experience the internal trigger of, ooh, I better, know what's, I better need to know what's going on in the world today because at the water cooler at work, I don't want to sound like an idiot. That fear of being out of the know, when are they likely to feel that in their day? When they wake up, right? First thing in the morning. That's when we turn on NPR on our way to work. That's when we open up uh, a web browser to figure out the news. That's when people naturally go to the news because they feel this inter internal trigger of fear of being out of the know. And so when do they time that one 
external trigger of the day when the person wakes up. And they would modify it. They figure out when to send the external trigger, figure out what, when the behavior actually occurs, and they tailor it per the user. I understand. That's, what I, that's the rumor I've heard. Mm -hmm. That they start figuring out when you're most likely to want to receive that external trigger based on that investment that you put into the app. All right, I think we're at the end of our time here. But again, um, really appreciate everything. And I have just one final question. So for those of you that um, want to learn more, obviously the book's a great resource. I've actually read the book twice. I read it last year when the initial version came out and then when they uh, published the, the hardcover. Uh, so I would highly recommend it. And um, I had some colleagues that last year went to the Hooked Summit, which they raved the about. Summit. The Heavens Summit. They said it was just absolutely awesome. And I wonder if you would like to talk a little bit about this year's um, Habit sure. Summit. Uh, so the Habit Summit is actually almost sold out at Stanford this year. You're welcome to check it out, habitsummit.com. Let me uh, make one announcement. If you have a question, by the way, or if you want to, if you didn't get to ask a question, you want to have some one-on-one -on -one time. I actually uh, block uh, time in my calendar every single week for whoever wants to you know, ask a question. If you've read the book and you something didn't make sense for you and you want to talk, just go to uh, nearandfar.com. At the top right-hand corner, it says schedule. You don't even need to email me. You can just book the time yourself, and we can chat uh, if you'd like, one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, do you want to talk about the summit? When is the summit? Oh, the summit is uh, March 24th at Stanford. Thank you, Nier. Thank Let's you. give him another round of applause. So we have a, 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 an addition to the Product Austin uh, uh, collection here. We've got a website that's not quite up yet, but it will be up shortly. And that website is going to feature two things. First thing it's going to feature is a recorded stream of tonight's event, when it, once it's ready. And the other one is we've got another uh, Product Austin meetup coming up in a couple of months. We are skipping April, but in May, we are going to have Brian Balfour, VP of Growth at HubSpot and blogger at coelevate.com. So you'll also be able to uh, RSVP to that event through the Product Austin website. So uh, as usual, after these events, we have an attendee survey, and we encourage you to take that survey. That will go out shortly after this event. And don't forget that you can validate your parking at the front desk. And finally, ah, our door prizes. So we were going to do the door prizes based on, uh, where we're going to have two door prizes. And one was going to be based on the best question for the speaker, and the other one based on whoever tweeted Product Austin the most. <laughs> so I'm not sure if anybody has counted that, but maybe we should get to work on that one. Um, but as far as the best question, I think maybe near my... I know. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody have any nominations for the best question? I liked her question. Yeah. She had a best question. <laughs> what about Mary? Yeah, Mary. <laughs> so what do you think? Uh, do you think Mary should get the prize? Awesome. So I do happen to know uh, one particular individual who did a lot of tweeting with the Product Austin hashtag and or the Product Austin uh, handle, Twitter handle, which you might want to follow actually because when that website is ready, uh, that will be getting tweeted through that, uh, uh, through that Twitter account as well as other places though. Um, so I'm going to do a quick uh, look up here of that, that person who was tweeting up a store. Yes, that's the one. So uh, let's see if I'm getting this pronounced correctly. Sabari Krishnan. All right. Tweet R. Now we've got uh, Brendan and Andre. Who do you think's the winner among those? I think it's Andre. All right. <laughs> Thank you.
Good later. <laughs> You'll, uh, I guess we don't have a copy of the book right now handy, but you'll get it. We'll get it. <laughs> I was getting, I was hooked. I was hooked. <laughs> yeah, the regular reward. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're done, folks. Feel, feel free to stick around for a little while and uh, network if you like. Um, and again, look out for the announcement of that uh, uh, RSVPs for the next meetup.